Hello, welcome everybody. So happy to have you here today for our first presentation of our uh, STEM education speaker series. And today we have our special guest speaker, Dr. Shanna Lee. She's going to be delivering this presentation, Making Science Fair, Science Processes Becoming a Daily Routine. She is the Director of K-12 Outreach and Student Programs for the Bagley College of Engineering at Mississippi State University. She serves on the Executive Board for the Mississippi Science and Engineering Fairs and is the current President for the Southeastern Association for Science Teacher Education. She earned degrees in Chemistry and Secondary Science Education. Her PhD is in curriculum and instruction and dissertation, and her dissertation is on outdoor education programs and professional development. She has over 10 years of secondary classroom experience and enjoys working with students, teachers, and administrators in her outreach, outreach position. Um, welcome, Dr. Lee. We're so excited to have you, and I'm going to let you take it away. You still have the um, fire alarm going off? You're muted. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. It just ended. So okay. every the first Tuesday of every month, we have a tornado siren that goes off and it's right next door. So it's very loud and I apologize for that. Um, but th thanks for the introduction. Is the screen good? I couldn't hear all of that. Okay, um, so I'm Dr. Lee. I'm here to talk about making science fair. Um, science process is becoming a daily routine. Um, this is a play on a lot of the things that I do and the title will make sense as we move forward. Um, okay. Um, I don't know why it's not working, but I'll, I'll work with that. Okay, so what I hope you take from this talk, um, I wanted to make sure that we started this with the understanding that I'm not doing an empirical study. Currently, I'm 100% service. Um, so what I wanna do is talk about my experience and uh, the multiple hats that I wear. And I hope that you take something away that you can apply with your, um, your practices. So, um, why am I going to talk to you? I have a lot of hats. So um, I, you can kind of see the little um, picture over here. It says, how many hats are too many hats? And I felt like that this morning. So this is the Mondayest Tuesday I've ever had. And I think we're all uh, experienced this, experiencing the same thing. So um, what I wanna do is just kind of take a deep breath and tell y'all all about me and all the hats that I wear. And hopefully I can inspire you um, to get involved in something. So that's the first thing I want to talk about. Specifically, the Southeastern Association for Science Teacher Education. That's a hat that I'm wearing right now. I'm wearing the president hat for that. And we're having a conference October 7th. Really, it's October 6th, 7th, and 8th. But the majority of the presentations and the, the meat of the conference is on October 7th in Gulf Shores, Alabama. We're gonna be at the lodge in the Gulf Shores State Park. And we are going to talk about science education. So if it's something that you're interested in, we hope to see you there. My email, um, my email is here. And please just contact me, reach out to me. I can I already have one right, right whenever we started. Somebody wants some information, so I can give you all of the information on that. I will say it's during the shrimp fest, so the hotel rooms are filling up fast and if you have issues with that, just let me know and I can I can help work something out. But what you'll get during this conference is a sample of um, professional development talks, maybe um, some science methods course, so we have a lot of elementary science methods course talks that we'll have. And then we have some some real deep research, empirical research for uh, noise grants and things like that. But then we have a couple of guys who take a walk on the um, Appalachian Trail and survey a bunch of different people and they pull together a presentation that's always very fun to listen to. Um, so we have a, a big variety of, um, I guess, information for the day. The other thing I want to talk about, and it's 
I think I have a lot of um, graduate students maybe that are listening or will listen to this. The Association for Science Teacher Educators is the parent um, conference for SASTI. And my first role was a leadership role for the Graduate Student Forum. And I walked in, I was wrapping up my classes and going into full-time dissertation. I walked into a the, the leadership forum and just, I don't know what got into me, but I nominated myself for president-elect. I didn't know a single soul in that room, but I got the majority of the votes. And through that role, through getting involved and just pushing myself a little bit more, I have made more friends in this, um, in this environment than I can imagine. I have connections at multiple universities and in multiple countries. So it's really, really good just to get involved. Don't doubt yourself, just do it. Just jump off the ledge um, in a good way. So what I want to do is encourage you guys to, if you can't come in October, to maybe see if you can come to the ASD, the uh, conference in Salt Lake City. There will be lots of snow. So if you want to snow, uh, see snow, which we never get to see, or um, maybe even ski, then reach out to me and I can give you some more information on that conference as well. So get involved. That's our first thing I, I want you to do. Science fair is something, of course, I'm going to talk about, but I just want to give you my background. My hat is more than six years of experience with science fair, and I serve on the board of directors. Uh, Dr. Buford's also on here as well, and, and he um, he's on that board as well. So, um, but we don't know each other, but we do. Um, it's a it's a great program that we're going to talk about in a minute. I also have a background in chemistry methods courses that I've been teaching. Um, I teach at high schools. I talk, I do at least one professional development a semester. And I always sprinkle in outdoor education because that's what my dissertation was in. So that's just a little taste of all of the hats I have. And I hope that I can give you enough sprinkles of these roles to um, encourage you to implement some things. So I want to talk about what is science fair. I really wanted to have a discussion. Um, first, you can see these two pictures. So of course we're gonna talk, but I know everybody's seen this um, on social media. It says, how much turmoil does a science project cause families? And my job or our job as, a, as the role of board of directors is to take this stigma of the yucky science fair that just gets handed to parents or handed to students and make teachers understand or encourage teachers to actually implement it into their content, into their curriculum with their content. So that's where I want to start, but we need to talk about what is science fair. And instead of me telling you, I want to know what you guys know. Um, so just unmute yourself and, and don't be afraid to chat. Anybody? Okay. <laughs> I'll call somebody out, Emma, Kara. There's a comment in the chat. My experience was in the fifth grade, so it was very basic and seemed a waste of time. There we go. <laughs> Let me move this over here. Um, yes, very basic. I hope to encourage everybody to move past that, to move past the basic. Um, from what I understand, most of you are graduate students going into the field of science education. So let's actually put science into our curriculum make science fair and put it in our everyday lives so i'm going to move forward talking about it because nobody wants to talk today there's a couple more comments in the chat okay. it's time for kids to get a deeper understanding of fun science um supposed to test children's ability to have ownership of an independent learning project through science chance for kids to plan and do experiments that are no longer a class period. Okay. Is that all? One new. A way to make science interesting for kids. Yes. So yes to all of those. Um, one thing I did want to see, and I'll move forward to my next, well, this way. 
PowerPoint. Okay, so the big picture that we need to get from Science Fair and implementing it into our classrooms is we need to teach the nature of science. So y'all have been in the standards, the Common Core standards, the standards for Mississippi, and you've seen the science and engineering practices. All of those have these key words that come from the nature of science. Observations, inferences, questions, collecting data, analyzing it, communicating that data, so communicating what you know. Um, if you're a little timid by the nature of science and that wording, then as long as you understand that it's a process that you can teach so that students understand how scientific knowledge is created and again validated, then um, that that helps you with that. Someone also said it's a great preparation for lab reports in college. I didn't see the reason for it then, but now that I'm very grateful or now I'm very grateful for it. So, hey, we got a positive comment. Um, I will be completely honest. Like I said, I'm sharing my experience with you guys. Whenever I was offered the role of science fair director, I took it because it got my foot in the door. But you'll see in this next picture, once I did direct a year of science fair, I realized after going to the international science fair, what doors it really can open. And um, other than teaching the process, which I'm going to harp on some more, you'll hear that about, about it some more. There's something called the Regeneron International Science and Engineering Fair. And my first experience with that, there was over 80 countries involved. We were in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That was my first experience. There's more security here than at a Super Bowl because you're dealing with so many countries and so much knowledge. But um, these students compete, not with their travel boards. Most of them end up making posters by the time they get there, but you still see the travel boards. And they compete with their science fair project for tons and tons of money and opportunities. Just having the fact that you were chosen to go to this science fair can get you into MIT. And that has happened with some of the students that we've had go through Mississippi. They were put on the MIT waitlist. They wrote on their scholarship resume, hey, I got accepted. The next day, they, they were an MIT student. So it's a big deal. And so this is a picture of the guy in the middle. His name's Robert. And he, um, that's a lot of wording, but he developed a different way and a hopefully more economical way to uh, power electric motors for electric vehicles. So these are high school students and we can empower these students to do that through teaching the processes of science or the nature of science. And if you're still interested, you're like, ah, she's, I don't really care, but I'm kind of interested, then I really want to encourage you guys to go watch the movie called Science Fair. It was, um, I guess, filmed by National Geographic and produced by Sundance Films. It was released a couple of years ago and it follows four or five different high school students through their process for, for Science Fair and making it to ISEF. And it reaches multiple countries. I think there's two from the US and the rest are from other countries. So it's very interesting. If you really want to just, you know, really be involved or really understand what it is, I said go watch that movie. But let's dial it back to our local picture. So in our classrooms, what we need to do, um, understand that it's not just the travel board. We don't need to think, okay, we're planning for this big day. We're going to hand this packet to the, pre to the uh, parents and the students and say, do this, and then have this day with tables and chairs and have them present. What we need to do is actually implement it into our classroom. So that goes through those engineering processes that are, or science and engineering processes that are in our standards that we have to teach. Um, we need to know that if we do this, teaching this nature of science or teaching this process, it helps students understand the world. And then back to my title, daily routines and everyday problems that they can solve. And here's another one I want to, I hope y'all can chat with. You don't have to actually speak. I can read the chats now. So um, making science fair through science fair. Science fair can make science fair. Lots of science fair here. Um, 
my three key terms here are equitable, attainable, foundational. So teaching these process, processes is the foundation of teaching science. You don't need to sit in your classroom. I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir for most of you. Don't sit in your classroom and throw a bunch of content out. Instead, teach them how to do science so that they can understand how to use that content. Um, but how can we, we know what science fair is, a few of us have done it. How can we actually take this and put it in our classroom? It would be easier if we get to hear your voices, but we don't have to. Um, but I, I wanna give you all a couple of seconds or minutes to, to take that on. What's your thoughts? We'll use some wait time. Come on, guys. Is anybody in the classroom or plan to be in the classroom? Kendrick has his hand up. Oh. <laughs> so I think that implementing science in the classroom really does depend on the age group you're looking at, the target population that you're looking at, and just the outcome and expectations of that student body. And so to me, the easiest thing is setting that general goal of what do you want your students to take from doing science fair? And in some cases, like you said, it really is the nature of science. And anyone who teaches at a collegiate level knows that one of the greatest hardships we have is that students come to our classes expecting science to be all dogmatic and answer based. One is to essentially teach the exams and tests, but they want to do things that involve critical thinking skills like doctoring and lawyering and all these other things. And so how do we bridge that gap between teaching facts and teaching them how to think about science? And once you set that as your foundation, I think it just becomes if it's a 9 to 12 grade level, is that a is there a project-based class you can have them sign up for? Is it a dual enrollment class you can have them sign up for? Can you give a little bit of your planning period? And if it's a K through eight class, um, can you com commit some days, maybe once a week to just science fair Fridays or science fair Mondays? You got to dress it up and make it sound fun, of course. And once you do that, the kids really start to love it. Then they might actually just start doing science fair at the house, which I know is a small burden on the parents. But if you'll send them to soccer or little, little league, I imagine you also want them to learn about the thought process behind science. Although I guess I imagine, um, I don't have any kids, so maybe soccer and little league is just an excuse to send the kids out the house and you just watch them from the window. I don't I don't know what goes on there, so. Thank you, Dr. Bugert. Um, you hit a lot of points that I have coming up. So, um, and you also gave some time for people to talk. So we have um, Candace who says, Bring actual scientists into the classroom to walk students through science processes and have volunteers work with students during the process. Um, I'm in the library, so I can't speak out loud right now. Thank you. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Um, and then uh, Dr. Wallace said, one of my children's teachers taught the scientific method by having class participate in an experiment. And she pointed out the parts of the methods as they went through the experiment. Also assisting students in the classroom by finding projects they fall in love with, like their personal interests rather than uh, random tests. So um, all three of you, and if you have any more thoughts, just throw them in. We'll talk about it some. But those are all great thoughts. Um, don't make it so hard. That's what I want to say. Um, you can do a demonstration. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> she said Dr. Downing gets the, the credit, so given the credit where it's due. Um, so don't make it hard. We want to make science fair in our classrooms. I know that's a play on word, so we want to make it equitable. We don't want to give them this expectation that they need to go somewhere and spend all of this money and make this extravagant board. Um, it's okay if you if you jot your stuff down on a paper and glue it up. That's fine. We don't want, uh, we want to make it attainable. So maybe we all have the issue where we don't have Wi Fi places and, and we need to make sure that students can do these things. So, like someone mentioned, 
making the science fair Fridays or inviting an actual scientist in, maybe they, maybe you have someone at a very high level who can make connections with that scientist and go to their lab. Um, sorry, I was reading. Uh, make sure students see representation of themselves, very, very important. Um, so especially if you bring in scientists, that's a good thing to do. Um, and then also bridge in the gap between the university and your K-12 environment. And that's really my main job in the university. So um, I like that that was brought in as well. Make it foundational. You can have students do science fair or practice the processes of science in your classroom and they don't even know you don't have to title it this is science fair you can give different groups something to do and make it a whole part of a big science experiment and then talk about the processes that they went through and explain to them this is science um, so don't make it hard that's that's really what i wanted to make sure i said and uh moving on to the next slide this is just i think this is funny because it's a monday tuesday um, but I feel like some of us could have done this today. So the picture you see, that's the traditional scientific method or the processes of science, however you want to say it. But if we teach those, then maybe this morning when the toaster element, when we popped our toast and pushed it down and the element was not on, maybe the students didn't go run and say, mom, the toaster's broken. Maybe they said, why doesn't my toaster work? Is it plugged in? Yes, it's plugged in. Maybe there's something wrong with the outlet. If there's something wrong with the outlet, then something that actually does work, like my coffee maker, wouldn't work. So let's see, let me plug it in. Oh, it works. So there's something wrong with my toaster. That is this process. That is the making it a daily routine. That's what I'm talking about. Um, I know it's very elementary, but that's, that's what I'm trying to make sure y'all don't make it hard. Um, this is another example, and I really like that Dr. Buford brought in. Um, it encourages them to be lawyers because this literally happened to me. I had I was teaching part time at a local school, and I also was doing a science fair club. And one of the students was in there with me. We met 20 minutes a week, and she had watched a documentary on climate change and wanted to do a science fair project on climate change. Well, I had to talk her down and say, that's not necessarily something that we can do from our home, but she was more interested in the research that she was getting. And so I, not traditionally, I know, but I nudged her to a meta-analysis and I forget what question she had, but it just made more sense for her to do that. And she got so involved. I think every waking minute she spent doing this and she, she actually pulled strands and she started comparing different countries. She's compared Australia, China, of course, and the US. And she was able to pull out a lot of information from this to the point where right before we went to present, she said, if I knew this was science, I would have done it a long time ago. Um, it sparked her interest to become an advocate. She placed at the regional, she placed at state fair, and um, it led her to become a lawyer. She graduated um, with her law degree from Southern, or maybe it's her, I don't know if it's from Southern or not. I know she went there for a little while. But then I say last week in this PowerPoint, it's actually been two weeks, she sent a picture to me of her at Capitol Hill, all because of the Science Fair Project. It is, it might be the thing that you don't see a lot of stuff in because you had to do it. But if you do it the right way and you give those students ownership, and this is the real science fair project that I'm talking about, it, it has great results and rewarding results as a teacher. So I wanted to make sure I, I told y'all about that. I'm not going over time. Okay. Um, well, I went back. Okay. I want to move past science fair and we can talk more about it in the end if we need to, but I want to talk about the professional development I do. So I'll just kind of stick another hat on. I mentioned to you, I can't do anything without talking about outdoor education. It's just impossible for me to do. I mean, you can see outdoors in my office right now. Um, it's, it's important to me being outside. 
I do anything, if you see my little acronym here, stream dash X, Y, Z, I do it all. But when I look at that, I think school. You know, when I look at stream, I think school. Let's just do it outside. Um, let's just, like I put there, let's ditch the acronym stream and actually get into the stream. We can actually do all of those contents, meet them all in the water. Um, I'm not saying go every day, but now we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but I do want to talk to you about a professional development. The first time I did it, I was with high school teachers who I took them outside to look at a tree right outside the building. They walk in this entrance every single day. They didn't even know this tree existed. So I want you to think about, I know we're all in different buildings, but did you notice that tree to the left of the building? Did you notice what was even there when you walked in? That's observations. That's the basics of the basics of science processes that we need to teach our students. And um, I showed them this tree. We did multiple lessons with this tree. They were so intrigued. This tree became their new friend and they told me they've used it in multiple lessons since. Um, one main thing I do is called I Notice, I Wonder. And this is something you can do in any content. I have seen it done in every single content, even art, history, math, English, all of them. Um, it's very good with primary resources. So for social studies example, I don't know if I have any of you guys here, but you can pull in a, a primary resource from a library and have the students actually observe it and look at it. That's implementing scientific processes in social studies. But, um, Awesome. Um, but I want to, you know, make sure we hit all ages because you can hit all ages. And uh, I want to give you this picture. I want to practice it with you guys. Some of you can't talk. So what I want y'all to do is throw it in the chat, um, just not to make it so awkward. Um, <laughs> so let's see. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of a tree. Let me make sure I do it right. I'm not gonna tell you all about this tree, but I want you to take 10 seconds and write in the chat box, what do you notice? Tommy. Okay, so we'll stop. We'll stop there. I'm going to kind of go through them. I know it may take a minute for y'all to enter. Okay, big, long limbs, old, beautiful live oak, wide, epiphytes. I'm not a biology person, chemistry. Um, short trunk, low branches. Huge long tree limbs. I notice a place I have shared memories. Okay, somebody knows what this is. Possibly an oak. The branches are very straight at the base. I noticed that the tree goes over the walking path, short and long. Was it struck by lightning or something? Wait a minute. That's an inference or a question. It's not an observation. I'm not picking on you, but I want you to know that if you take this and do this, you're teaching, so I'm teaching. Wait a minute, that's not an observation. What is an observation? Or what is something you notice? I kind of skipped over that and, and told you what, what it is, observa what an observation is. But um, old, let's see. I noticed that the tree limbs are facing towards the ground, probably old, sprawling. Okay, I think we've hit the, the last bit. So, I did stop and I started the science word observation, but when we started this, I didn't say, what do you observe? I said, what do you notice? So for our younger students, you're, you're teaching them a term in the end, you're teaching them observe and what that is. And then maybe for the older students, you're stopping them not to get ahead of themselves. We have to really look at things first. So you're teaching them how to observe. 
Um, the next thing is, so did I notice, or what do you observe? The next thing is, I wonder, okay? And I'm, I'm really gonna give y'all 10 seconds on this because this could get out of hand, I know. But um, I wonder, so throw some wonder comments. Y'all can finish up if you need to, but I'm just going to start. So one says, I wonder if it was trained to go to grow so straight. Um, I wonder how old. I wonder how old. A lot of that. Um, I wonder when it was planted. I wonder if it was struck by lightning at some point. There you go. <laughs> I wonder how old it is. I wonder how many times the tree's been cut. Because we do see that. We observe some cuts there. I wonder what the what it, had, what it has experienced, where is that tree? We wonder where that tree is. I wonder if the tree is on a college campus. I don't know. Um, I wonder how old the tree is. I wonder how many organisms are living in it. I wonder how many people swung from the branches, how many more limbs it has, why it's so big, and how it was impacted by Katrina. So somebody knows where this is. Um, I wonder what historical moments this tree was a part of. Um, this is actually, so I decided to pull something from uh, USM. So this is actually called the friendship tree. I have never seen it in person, but it is on the coast, right? Yes, and it's beautiful. Yeah, so um, some people did know what it was. And so if you ever get a chance to, to find it and go see it, definitely go see it. But just by what? We spent two minutes tops. It took me more time to read your comments. So if we were actually discussing in groups, it would it would have happened faster. But just stating observations and questions, I wonder the scientific term for that would be questioning. So we've taught the students how to observe and how to state questions and also what those terms are within a scientific process. You can move forward with this, and I want us to move forward with this. Oh, somebody said it's on the Long Beach campus. Okay. Um, so that's where it's at. Somebody says, sorry, I'm in a loud building. I actually had a very good experience in my elementary education and won the regional medal. Yay. That's back to science fair. So it actually impacted my understanding of my ability with STEM. That's great. Um, I think I got way out of the way there. Okay, let me get back to this. Thank you. Okay, there it goes. So what else can you do with this tree? Because we're all in loud areas, I want you, I'll, I'll just go ahead and talk about it so we save time. But you can take this further. You can have the students sit down under these beautiful branches and sketch this tree. You can look a little bit closer and you can see patches of white stuff all over this, which would be one of the first questions that the students actually had. What is this stuff? This stuff is lichen. You can do lichen tests. You can observe lichen. You can do a whole unit on lichen just by looking at this tree outside of our window. Now I know every campus or every place doesn't have such a beautiful tree, but I promise you there's lichen on a tree outside of your classroom window. Um, does anybody want to comment what else you can do? You can talk about symbiosis, so that's with your, your lichen in your tree. I'll give about 30 more seconds if anybody wants to comment. Photosynthesis, human impacts, invasive natural species. You can learn about tree aging and size. If you could see those cuts, if you could count those rings, that would be really cool. Uh, size and dealing with weather, the right kinds of conditions you'd need for a tree to live that long. The root system. Yes, I always tell people, don't plant trees by your house because whatever's on top is on the bottom. <laughs> so just think about this root system. 
uh, comparing human anatomy with tree anatomy and physiology. I want to be in that class. Uh, discuss history, growth, certain species and how they grow. So these, these limbs. So we had a lot of, I wonder why they're sprawling or whatever we said. And then ecological relationships. So much can be done with this tree. We went outside for two minutes. We talked about this tree and made observations and we brought all of this experience that we got in two minutes into our classroom and look at all of these units we can do. Uh, we just had acorn production and mast ears. Y'all are making me put my glasses on too much. <laughs> Environmental impacts of the tree. So that can be drawn back to uh, Katrina and starting to think I know it's wild, but these kids, some of these kids weren't even alive during Katrina. Um, so it's, it's good to, to bring that back to weather. So I'm gonna move on. I know we can talk about this all day. I told you it's my favorite thing, but you're sitting here. I know some of y'all are thinking, there's no way my students could do this. I've never seen a class that could do this. Why could I take them outside? Well, the key is to set parameters, just like you would in your classroom. You need to set expectations. Do not cross this street. Do not go across this sidewalk. When you go outside, take your notebook, sit under the tree somewhere quietly, and I'll give you direction, just like you would do inside. Um, also, I want to tell you, don't let weather stop you from going outside with your classroom. Use it. So this picture here is a picture of a weather station that we I say we, um, Dr. Sarah Log is one of my friends and she'll be at the conference in October. So you might get to meet her. Um, she got this weather station at our partnership school on campus. This is something we have seen for years. She and I have worked with this at uh, Tremont in Tennessee for years. And it's so cool. All of the things you need to predict the weather are in this box. You can send a group of students out every day and they can start charting. So if they're charting this weather over a month or over the whole school year, hello, go present it at the science fair. You know, let's make science fair. Um, try to keep old donated clothing, uh, clothing within your closet if you do go outside a lot. That's one thing a lot of teachers start asking. Well, my, my students don't want to get their shoes dirty or if it's raining, can you know what can they use just just be aware you know just like you do anything as a teacher keep something on hand and just be respectful of the students so i've had students before i've taken them outside they don't want to walk in the grass because they really don't want to get their shoes dirty but then they see everybody else doing it you know give them a little task they can do on the sidewalk but then they see everybody else doing it and they think oh maybe my shoes they'll be fine it'll be okay also, there's fears that some of them have, uh, bugs, snakes. My favorite thing to do is go out and collect bugs and observe them, stick them in a film canister, have them draw them and talk about them and what environment they came from. You can talk about adaptation and habitat. And those students that did not want to touch that bug at first, they're all about bugs within 30 minutes. So um, just do it. Okay, I still have time. So um, another story about outdoor education and science fair, um, the tadpole. So when I was doing something called the Adventure Club at a local high school, this is a volunteer basis, but I gave the students something to collect things with. So they got to choose what they want, nets, whatever, and they could go within a certain area and collect something. Well, one of the students found a little ditch and there was fish in there but he, he wanted to catch them and he did and I said you know make sure there's enough water I told him how to do it and he did it he did it safely I was there watching him but then we all got in this circle after about 10 minutes of searching for something that's alive and you would think I, I do want to touch this real quick a lot of people or a lot of students think I have to get a bug I have to get a butterfly I have to get a fish whatever um, you can get a leaf or you can take a picture of a tree that's alive. So I do say you can take pictures if it's something you don't want to touch sometimes. It starts them understand their understanding of plants are alive. Some of them don't get that. But that's, like I said, a whole nother topic. But we're sitting in this circle and he's passing his tadpole around, talking all about it, so excited. I'm letting him have this minute. And one of the girls stops and says, I don't think this is a tadpole. 
And so I interject, which I know is not a typo, and I say, okay, what do you think it is? I think it's a fish, she says. I said, well, let's pass it around and everybody can look at it. And when it gets back to the, the fella, we'll let him look at it some more. And he did. And I said, okay, so we think it, one person thinks it's a tadpole, one thinks it's a fish. So let's think about back to our biology classes and what's the difference in both? And they started naming some things and the guy finally goes, oh, it's definitely not a tadpole, it's a fish. And this is why. I didn't have to tell him it was a fish. It's very important to let them learn on their own. Um, of course, this isn't something we can do every day, but I just wanted you to see if you could have 20 minutes where you've had these kids trained to do this, take them out right before homecoming week when everything's crazy anyway, let them see this stuff. They will get more from that than they will from the assignment that you have them doing in your classroom. The other thing I want to hit on is the combine. So I took a group of students to our local farm. It's called the North Farm here on campus. And in my head, this biologist or this botanist was going to talk about cotton and corn and actually the life cycle and photosynthesis and how they work and the genetics and all this stuff. No, he puts them on a combine and lets them pick corn. And I was mad. The, the teacher in me was, I was like, this is not what they're supposed to get from this. I can't stand it, blah, blah, blah. I let them do it. Then they pick the corn, put it all in this big truck and they get to play in it. I'm like, this is not what I wanted. Well, then the students started asking questions. Not that I think the botanist or the people over there thought that's what was gonna happen. I think they were just trying to get their duties done while they were helping me out. But they started asking questions. The corn was not all yellow. Why is that? So they got to talk about genetics of corn and it got to go deeper and deeper and deeper. Just use primary sources and that stuff sticks with them. I'll see those kids and they say, hey, you remember when we went to pick corn? And I'm like, yeah, that's so weird, but yes, I do. And, and it sticks with them. Give them experiences. That goes back to making science fair making science fair by giving them experiences because not all students get those experiences. Um, I was teaching science the whole time. So um, now, what do I expect you to get from this? Well, I want you to practice what you preach. So I'm not a big person on uh, PowerPoint. So I like to, you know, engage students in a different way. But in this situation, I can't do that. I promise you this is the first PowerPoint I've made since my dissertation. And I other than for a conference, but for a talk. And I, I almost forgot how to use PowerPoint. Um, practice what you preach. Sometimes PowerPoints are needed, like now and today, but not all the times. Um, and teach your science content while you're teaching the processes. I know content's important, but you've got to teach the processes and then stick your content in. And if you think of it that way, it becomes so much easier uh, to do in a classroom. Here's my final um, point. Make science fair, foundational, adventurous. That's that outdoor part. Or you can take outdoors inside or you could just do something adventurous inside your classroom. Make it attainable. Everybody needs to have those foundational experiences so that they can build their knowledge off of that. Equitable and make it everywhere and make it a daily routine. Um, then there's a quote that I threw in it's from Edwin Hubble. And he says, equipped with his five senses, man explores the universe around him and then calls that adventure science. Um, so I thought that was the most relatable to this talk. And um, before we discuss, I do want to encourage everybody before we get um, too far off and have to stop. I know I'm the first person, I'm the kickoff talk, right? Okay, so you're gonna hear at least what, every week or every two weeks, you're gonna hear a talk? Twice a month, yeah. Okay, every two weeks. So what I want you to do, instead of learning these, these things people are telling you and sticking it in your toolbox, I want you to pick one of those things and apply it to your teaching and to your, your pedagogy and what you need to do. And if you're not in the classroom right now, apply it to your life. 
just just apply it. Don't just stick it in there and let dust get on it um, and, and keep it until later because in science, it becomes outdated really fast. You need to apply it. Um, so what I want to do is go ahead into a discussion. How much time do we have for that? Uh, we have about 10 minutes. Some people can linger depending on everybody's schedules, but that's about how much time we have. Okay. Thank you so much for that. I love your advice at the end. And that Hubble quote is one of my favorites. Um, but yeah, uh, let's let's hear any questions, any thoughts you all have for Dr. Lee. Uh, thank you all. I'm gonna throw my email up just so y'all have it. You can contact me anytime. Well, getting a lot of thank yous and um, I appreciate that. But if, if there are any questions, you can, if you just wanna to talk to me privately, feel free to reach out. We do have a lot of um, full-time teachers that can't attend live, so they'll watch the recordings later, and they may, <clears throat> excuse me, have some some thoughts and questions for you as applicable to their actual classroom. So yes. I'll encourage them to reach out. We do have a couple comments. Uh, Candace, this may be controversial, but how do you feel about setting boundaries when it comes to visual aids or costs spent on the experiment? We had kids win when I was younger simply because they had the budget to a huge tri-fold board or tech savvy project. That's a good question. It's a very good question. And um, I've run science fair and I tell my judges, it doesn't matter what it looks like, look at this rubric and go buy it. It's something that I've tried to trickle down into my, my local science fair, so the school level. Um, but it is, it's heartbreaking. And so then at that point, your, your, um, your parents do the work. I mean, we're not silly here. We're not, we understand that. Um, and it all becomes, it's not equitable and it, and it really isn't. So as a teacher being in the classroom, it's our jobs to do that. And so that's why I included it in this talk. Um, however it works, every school is going to be different because we're all, we all have a different group of students and a group of parents that we're um we're seeing every day so it's going to be what works best with your school but what i recommend you doing is going to your administrator and saying we don't need this to happen give them my contact and say dr lee can give some advice on this or say here's a rubric it's on our website we make them readily available just say this is what we need to use for our science fairs um, that way it pulls away from all of this pretty stuff and um, it actually, the content actually gets judged. Um, there's a few more thank yous. There's a, I really agree with the interactive learning. There was a time I remember in kindergarten when we went outside and looked at things, or looked at acorns. Um, kindergarten guys, I'm not saying we're old, but that's a long memory. You're making that experience. And if you could do it for 20 minutes a semester and then add to it later, you're making great um, experiences for your students. Did you earn your PhD while teaching full time? No, but I was working full time. I was teaching part time and doing science fair part time. Um, did you use Project Learning Tree for outdoor learning? I did not, but it's a good resource. I do know about it. And there's also one for water. So if you're at an area where you have um, access to water, the name escapes me, but I can look it up if you're interested, just email me and I can get that to you. And another thank you, that's all I see. Um, like I said, email me, I'm very accessible. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Lee? All right. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Lee, for joining us. Um, hopefully you will see some or many of our um, STEM ed students at SASD in a couple couple very short weeks from now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're, we're hoping to encourage them. So y'all make sure you write down that date and we'll, you'll be hearing from us about that soon. Um, and again, thank you for being our kickoff for this uh, fall 
2022 STEM Education Speaker Series. It's so good to have you here. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. It was a little nerve-wracking. I didn't realize I wasn't going to get a Monday, but here we are in uh, about <laughs> That's <laughs> been the Monday as Tuesday ever. I agree with yeah. you. Oh, and by the way, excellent PowerPoint for not having done one since your dissertation. That was cool. Thank you. You could have fooled us, I think. Thank you. Y'all reach out to me. Don't be scared. I'm glad that y'all got to be here. All right. Thank you. See y'all.